Good morning. Morning. It's good to good to see you guys. What I can see. It's I, in case you've never been up here. It is, I mean, it's like this. You're kind of just a haze. So uh, it's all good though. Uh, a, a good looking haze. Uh, I, you know, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Keith. For those of you guys who uh, maybe haven't met me, I'm one of the elders here. I don't get to speak very often. I don't have to speak very often. I guess is more like it. Um, my, uh, I'm, but I'm really excited uh, to be here and share this message with you because it's a it's a message that actually got a little, a little confession to make. Uh, as we were kind of Jason was working through the summer and kind of making sure people were in place to preach because that's kind of important uh, with what we're doing here. Uh, he asked the elders to, to commit to, to doing a, an oppor- taking an opportunity to speak. And I was kind of reluctant at first. I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to sign up yet. You know, maybe, maybe the other guys will all step up and then I won't have to. And then I, um, he said, well, you know, it's kind of a first come first serve. We're doing the parables. And so I was like, all right, I'm signing up because I wanted this parable. I wanted the parable of the prodigal son because it's one that really speaks to me personally. It's one that has a has had a huge impact on me, Uh, and I hope this morning, as I share, that it will have a huge impact on you. That you'll get from this that you have a Father in heaven that loves you desperately, no matter what your situation is. If you leave there here knowing that, then I've done my job, right? If you don't. Uh, come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> uh, but we do, this is, a, this is a great parable. It is the gospel. It is the relational element of the gospel. And so, and relationships are important. Uh, we've all been called into relationships. We, we're here, we relate to other people. But relationships are also hard. Uh, and for me, relationships were hard. So just to kind of give you a little bit of uh, the reason why this parable has kind of always spoken to me is... Um, I have not always been the uh, cool and put together guy that you see before me t- today. <laughs> yeah. Good, you got the tongue in cheek element there. That, uh, that um, I, you know, I grew up, I, I went to 12 different schools between kindergarten and my graduation from high school. And that's not because my parents were military. There was no cool story behind it. We were just poor, uh, and we moved a lot, right? My dad was always looking for a better job. And in the process of all those moves, uh, it, was, it was interesting. It was really hard to build deep relationships when you're moving every once in a while, right? Uh, on average, once a year. Uh, and sometimes three times in one year. In fact, when my, my freshman year of high school, I moved three times, went to three different schools, started in Broken Bow, Oklahoma, went to the small uh, school in, uh, in Oklahoma City, a little Christian school. And uh, when I started that school, fun story, um, I had ringworm on my nose. That's not, I mean, in case you're wondering, if you don't have any experience with ringworm, it's gross. And it's a, it's a, <laughs> It's a parasite, and people don't really like parasites. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm going to attach some leeches to my face and, and see how that goes over. It's not a, it's not a great trick to become popular instantaneously. Uh, and, uh, you know, at other points, when I was living in Broken Bow, we had, uh, we had a family of skunks that decided to move in under our house. And uh, once again going to school reeking of skunk smell. There's no amount of uh, Stetson cologne, <laughs> Stetson cologne that you can put on to, cover, to mask. In fact, it just the, the combination of Stetson cologne, you can kind of just imagine it right now. Just imagine with me. Uh, it wasn't good. Uh, and so there were, it was hard for me to build relationships. And I was, I, I was blessed and thankful to have, uh, you know, family that loved me and uh, friends that kind of, inserted themselves into my life. And so for me, the gospel message has always been central to this idea of relationship. When I finally at 16 really understood the love of God for me as a stinky ringworm nosed uh, kid, and I got that for the first time, it was transformational. It was revolutionary. And so my hope for you is if you haven't found that, that's okay. You're, I mean, if, if you don't know, uh, don't have a relationship with Jesus, that's fine. Uh, but our goal here at Harvest is to, is to lead you into that relationship, to show you that it's not, um, it's not, a, a, it's not a prison, uh, it's a liberation. Uh, and so that's where, that's where we're going to go. Hopefully we'll see a lot of that this morning as we look at 
the uh, passage of the par- uh, prodigal son. But before we get into the prodigal son, we're going to start in Luke chapter 15, uh, verses 1 and 2. This is before the parable starts. It sets some context. And as we've talked about already, context is important as we're looking at these things. Uh, and so uh, if you don't have a Bible, by the way, uh, the, uh, um, the deacons or the deacons. See, I just went back to my old church and uh, we have deacons. Uh, the ushers uh, will be here to, so just raise your hand and they can get a Bible to you. You can take it home with you if you'd like. We want, uh, this is where we read about the love of God for us. So we want to make sure that you have access to that and, uh, and do that. If you're not doing that throughout the week, uh, it's, that's not just for Sundays anymore, right? Uh, we, can, uh, we can hear about this on a daily basis. So uh, in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, this is pretty quick. Uh, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. All right. uh, let's go ahead and pray as we, as we kind of dive into this uh, into the scripture. Um, God, we just thank you that uh, you are a God who uh, eats with sinners uh, and tax collectors and every other type of people on the earth. God, we thank you that you meet us where we are. Uh, God, I pray that this would be the the central message that everybody would hear uh, today is you are their God, you are their Father, uh, and you desire a relationship with them. Uh, so God, we, um, we lift this time to you. We give it to you and pray that you would speak to us. We just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here we have the setting, right? So we have tax collectors and sinners, right? We don't really know much about the kinds of sinners that were around there, but, you know, the Pharisees did. They probably had a pretty good record, you know. It's like, oh, it's that guy. I saw him, uh, you know, walking out of that building, that building at one time. Uh, and uh, the Pharisees and, and scribes uh, saw Jesus inviting these people in. And he, they were offended. They were shocked. Uh, it was a, uh, it was controversial. Uh, and so... In the middle of that, uh, Jesus hears them grumbling, right? You can't, I mean, there's a lot of times, we don't really know how loud this grumbling was. Maybe they thought that Jesus wouldn't hear them, you know, they're over here. Oh, uh, but Jesus knew. And so he tells three stories. We're only going to uh, t- uh, talk about one of them. But the first uh, talks about a, a, a guy who loses his sheep, right? He's a shepherd. He loses one of his hundred sheep and he leaves the 99 behind to go after the one, right? Uh, And then he tells another story about a woman who lost a coin and uh, she cleans her house and she's desperately searching for the coin. And both when they find what they're looking for, they celebrate. But then the third parable is the one that really gets to the heart of the message because it tells, you look at this parable and you think, okay, well, this is clearly, there's some groups here, right? Uh, So uh, in the parable, there happens to be three main characters. In this setting, there are three groups, right? There's the Pharisees and the scribes who are grumbling. There's the sinners and tax collectors who are coming. And there's the Father. Well, there's Jesus, right? So Jesus is clearly identifying himself here in this role as the Father. And so here he is. He tells, he, he'll, he'll, he's going to tell this story. And I'm going to kind of take, this is a story you're probably very familiar with, right? Uh, so that's always a danger is when you have something familiar. It's like, oh yeah, I heard this one a million times. There's even a show on Fox called Prodigal Son. It doesn't have anything to do with this though. Um, uh, just in case you wonder, don't, uh, don't go. I haven't seen it, so. Um, but there is, uh, he tells the story, I'm going to tell it from three different perspectives, right? So we're going to start with the, the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, that's that section, the first, uh, first few uh, in, from 11 to 32. So get this out of the way. Uh, so chapter 15, verse 11 through 32, uh, he says, And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything." All right, so this is pretty low point, right? Uh, eating what, I don't, yeah. Um, 
But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against you. He's got this speech rehearsed, right? He's ready. Father, I have sinned against heaven and, against, and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this, is, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. That's a good ending point, too, by the way, right? Uh, but the story's not over. Uh, and so here we have this, this story of the prodigal son. This is the part that we pay the most attention to. And we've, we've talked a lot about, uh, about him and his relationship with the father. And there's a couple things that I want you to get uh, as, we're, as we're looking to this. Uh, that this is clearly representing, uh, uh, represented by the people that, he's, that are attracted to him. Right? These sinners, tax collectors and sinners, these outcasts of society, the, uh, uh, those people. Um, and it's not just, so as he's, as he's talking about this, by the way, he's the youngest son. And I, you know, any, any youngest in here? Nobody's raising their hand because, is it just because the product? It's okay. I'm a youngest. Uh, it, there's nothing wrong with being a youngest, right? Uh, my, um, my son would be raising his hand high. Uh, but it is, um, he's the youngest. And he's a son. And, you know, so there's all these characteristics about that. But being a prodigal has nothing to do with being the youngest. Right? It has nothing to do with being young at all. It has nothing to do with being male or female. It has everything to, be, to do with being human. Right? Any of us have the potential of being prodigal. Prodigal just means wasteful and, uh, you know, uh, foolish. And we all have the opportunity uh, to be prodigal at times, and we're all drawn towards that. And you look at this passage, and you think, okay, uh, when did this separation first start? When did he, when did he, you know, he left? Obviously, he made this calling, but you look at this, and you see that the sin beginning to separate, uh, by the way, this is my first point, I forgot to mention that, um, that sin separates us, right? The sin that this guy, this, this prodigal had separated for him from his father, and that's the big problem with sin, right? is it separates us from a loving father. And you think about, you look at this, uh, this story and you think, okay, well, at one point he makes this declaration. He's like, basically, I wish you were dead, dad. I cannot wait for you to die to get your inheritance. I want it now, so give it to me. And so we look at that as a point of kind of the separation as he goes into the far country. You know, this is the way sin works. We, we're going to sin. We want to get away from everything, right? Uh, and, but the sin began separating him long before that. And think about this kid sitting in his father's house. Does he look like he has it pretty good? He's got servants. I mean, I don't, we don't have servants. We have a, we, we have a robot vacuum, uh, uh, which randomly cleans spots on the carpet. <laughs> um, but we don't have servants. Uh, he looks, I mean, he looks, he has an inheritance coming to him. I know, I didn't have, it, my, have an inheritance coming from my family. Uh, and so I look at this guy, and he's got it pretty good. And yet he's sitting in the palace. He's sitting in the comfort of his father's, his father's home. And he looks out, and he says, you know, there's something out there that's better, right? Uh, and he begins to look outward. He looks out there, and this, that sin, that drawing of sin, and that's the thing about sin is it always promises something that it can ever, can't ever deliver. Uh, and so you look at him, he, he says, okay, I'm going for it. I want that. And he declares that to his father. He leaves everything behind. He goes into a far country and he squanders everything. And this is the reality of sin. By the way, I, for those of you guys who don't know, I work as a um, juvenile detention uh, a teacher at the Juvenile Detention Center. Uh, and I see this all the time. I see kids that they bought into the promise of sin that it's going to give them freedom, 
It's going to give them, uh, whether it's through drugs or uh, gang activity or, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, whatever sin, it promises this, this big open freedom. And they land in their orange jumpsuits in, um, in my building, and there's no freedom in that. Right? And, and whether you end up in juvie or you end up uh, in a far country, the reality is sin will always take us someplace that we never intended for it to take us. And it'll leave us, just like the prodigal son, lost and alone. And he's sitting in this state. I mean, think about this now. He's in a far country. Uh, and the, kind of the implications are he's in Gentile territory, right? Uh, and so the famine hits. And all of a sudden, he's in need. And he has, he has nobody to turn to. And so he, he throws himself, he, he compels himself on one of the Gentile uh, pig farmers and says, let me just have a job feeding your pigs. Which, in case you didn't get, you know, don't get this, you're, we're not from a Jewish culture, but pigs are, they're, they're dirty, they're unclean animals, right? This is not... Uh, this is not the high, you know, this is not the life he was, he was longing for. This isn't what, this isn't what sin promised him. And he, he begins to, to want what the pigs are eating. And have you guys ever seen what pigs eat? And have you guys ever raised pigs? Uh, I had a pig for one night. That's uh, my story. Uh, we lived in Oklahoma. I got it in the winter. It was about, I think it was January. We put it on our, in our you know, back porch. This is the same house that's just going to live under, but it's not, not a high-quality home. Um, and uh, the porch area got really cold, and he froze to death. Uh, I mean, it was like chink, chink, chink in the morning. So um, uh, I know they said you're not dead till you're warm and dead, but we just assumed he was dead. Uh, so... Uh, Sorry, no, don't, don't report me to PETA. It was, I was probably 12, I think, or something at the time. So uh, uh, I, I, I would do better today. Um, but pigs are, pigs are not, I mean, they're, they're, what we, we think of them is the food that they eat is gross. They're not discriminate eaters, right? They, um, they, they'll eat pretty much anything you put in front of them. And so the fact that he was hungry, he was longing after the food that the pigs were eating, that shows a desperation. And you wonder, in the middle of all this need and all this want, when did he first start to want to go home? Any of you guys ever thought about that? This guy, he's hit, he's hit rock bottom and then keeps going lower and lower and lower. And he could have gone home at any time. Why did it take him so long until he got to the point where he was hungry for what the pigs were eating? I'm going to... I'm going to say that, what, that what's in there, what kept him from going back is, is in his response. He says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And what you hear in that is the voice of shame. So not only does sin separate us from the Father, but shame separates us from the Father. It kept him from returning. It kept him from going back because he felt like, I don't deserve to be my father's son anymore. And the problem with that is that it focuses on the word deserve. When we start to believe that we have to earn, we have to deserve the love of the Father, then shame can separate us, right? Shame can keep us. And he had a lot to be ashamed of, right? Let's be honest. He'd blown it in pretty much every way possible. But it's still a false belief that being a son is tied in any way to what you do or don't do. But that's his, that was his belief system. He believed that he no longer was worthy to be called a son because of the, th of the awful things that he'd done. And he had a society that kind of reinforced that. You look at it in the story and we can see, um, we can see it clearly in the fact that he was feeding pigs, right? And nobody would feed him. Everybody's kind of looking at this guy like, maybe we've seen people and we've looked at him that same way. They kind of got what they have coming to him. He deserves it. And so society reinforced that idea that um, you get what you deserve. 
And you look at it in the, in the, in the beginning in verses 1 and 2 also, you see that their society reinforced this idea that shame, that you, if you don't earn it, you don't deserve it. The Pharisees and the scribes, they were judging these people, right? These tax collectors and sinners saying, you don't really, you don't really deserve. They, their shame was being reinforced over and over and over again by a, sin that, by a society that says, uh, you know what? It is about what you do. So that's going to take us to the second part of the story, right? So we have the prodigal son, and we're, we're familiar with him, and he's, we'll, we'll get to a little bit more of the response of the father and how he runs to him uh, a little bit as we look at his story. But I just wanted to focus on where he's at right there. He's broken. He's alone. He's, he's bought into this lie that sin was going to make him happy, and it's left him miserable. And alone. And his shame is keeping him from going back. And he finally says, you know what? It's not worth it. Even, even to be a hired hand in my father's house would be better than this. And so he does go back. And let's read the rest of the story. Now, after the, this reunion between father and son, his father you know, runs to him, kisses him, puts a robe on him, puts a ring on his finger, kills the fat and calf. They're having a party, Right? Uh, and so in verse 25, it says, Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and draw near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And, he said, and they said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he was rece has received him back safe and sound. But he, the older son, was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I, I never, never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured his property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that, I, all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost, and he is found. Okay, so we have this separation. This, uh, this, the prodigal son has been separated from the father because of his sin and because of his shame. And now we have this oldest, older brother stepping in. Uh, and a lot, you got to think, the Pharisees and the, and the scribes, as they're looking at this, is like, finally, somebody's making sense, right? Because what this father's doing is crazy. Uh, the son, he deserved to feed pigs. Uh, and this, this older son, he's got it together. He knows what it's about. Uh, and they're... They're buying that same lie that the, son, that the younger son bought into is this idea that it's earned and deserved. But for them, because they felt they earned it, it resulted in self-righteousness. But the self-righteousness separates us from the father just as much as the shame does. Right? And when you look at this, we, you know, a lot of you guys may be real, kind of in that same boat where as you look at the story, maybe you've never been a prodigal. Maybe you've never really, you've, you've never uh, chased after sin. Uh, but maybe you kind of have this heart of, uh, you know, I feel pretty good about myself. Uh, and there's that temptation for us to fall back uh, on this idea of earning and deserving. It's what our society is built on, isn't it? Earning and deserving. Any of you guys ever been offended by the fact that somebody that was incompetent got promoted? Because right? that's what we do in, uh, in certain institutions. I, I'm a teacher. Uh, and uh, so I've seen a few examples of promoting incompetence. We can't fire this person, so let's make them, uh, let's put them in this job uh, and give them more money. Uh, right? And we, we're offended by that. It's unfair. It's unjust. Because it's about earning and deserving. Uh, maybe uh, it's, you look at our political system and you think, well, how did these people rise to the top? Clearly, not, cream is not the only thing that rises to the top, right? Uh, <laughs> that 
how does our system reward people who are maybe so dishonest and so broken? Uh, and maybe, maybe you haven't thought about those big concepts. My wife and I were talking the other, the other day about traffic, right? It's about traffic, too, because if you've ever been in one of those uh, the, uh, construction situations where you, you're driving down the freeway and there's a sign that says, right lane ends one mile, right? And so being the good older son, you pull over to the left-hand lane and you queue up in a line of cars that are all kind of other, first, other uh, firstborns that are all just kind of in the left lane. We're like, okay, yes, yeah, so we're going to be an hour late. But, um, and then all these, first or these youngest kids are zooming by you, zooming by you, and they're at the very end. They turn on the signal and try and squeeze in. And here you are as the, the person who obeyed the rules. You're like, no, I'm not letting them in. I'm not letting them in. Right? And so you're like actually pushing the person in front of you. Uh, right? You've been there? That's because our society is built on this, it, it, built on this idea of earned and deserved. They didn't earn the right to be there. I did. And... When we look at that, I mean, obviously in, in traffic, it's right. They should get over, right? I'm just, I'm not, I'm not justifying that. I'm not saying God, God, will, God will forgive them, but uh, I don't have to. No. <laughs> we see, though, that that idea of earning and deserving leads, can lead to an idea that we, we earn and deserve the favor of our Father. Right, that for some reason, you look at some of the words that this oldest son uses too, and you're like, the kid, the teenagers in the room, when he says things like, I've never disobeyed you, right? All the kids are like, yeah, yeah. All the parents are like, whatever. Right? There's no kid like that on the planet, right? But in his mind, he's, you know, and in comparison to who? In comparison to the little brother, yeah, he's, he's pretty good. But he's not perfect, right? And nothing that he's gotten from his father is something that he's earned. All this stuff is this inher inheritance that he's so big on and this, the fat and calf. Who's fat and calf is it? It's father's. Right? Uh, to do with what he wants and what he pleases. Uh, and... So it's easy for us to kind of focus on the prodigal son and see how separated he was, but we forget that the one person who didn't go into the party is the older brother. His self-righteousness was separating him from, the, uh, from the, the love of the father in the same way that the shame and sin were separating the younger brother. So enter the father. Right, so we're going to take a look at a couple of, uh, couple of uh, sections from the father's response to both these kind of messed up kids, right? Uh, and so we're going to look at the, the, the parable of the, prod, uh, the prodigal God in some ways because you look at it, what he's doing is pretty wasteful, right? Uh, he's extravagantly loving his kids. Right? And you see this, first of all, when the prodigal son comes home and we see this has been one of those, there was a song back in the, uh, back in the 80s or early 90s, I can't remember, uh, but it's been in my head, it's like, uh, when God ran, have you guys heard it? And then he ran to me, took me in his arms, held my head to his chest. Anyways, uh, so it's been, in my, uh, it's been in my head a lot lately. But we, we focus on that. We see the father, I mean, he was looking for him. We've heard sermons about the, the, the father saw him from a long ways off. That means that the father was looking for him, right? That he ran. It was indignant for a father to run to his son like that. But he ran to his son. And he gave him the best of everything. Because he was his son, not because he earned it or deserved it, but because of he, he was born into it. And so we, we've talked a lot about that, but I want to focus a little bit more on the other interaction. Where we have this father who goes to the older brother, who's refusing to go to the party. Right? And once again, the father sees that. 
Right? And he notices that the, the older brother isn't there, and he's like, where, where is he? And he goes and he looks for him. He goes out to him also. And he says, come on, come to the party. And he explains to him his love for the, for the younger brother and why he's doing what he's doing. He's like, all I have is yours. And literally it was. His, son had, his other son had already blown through the, the inheritance. Everything else was going to be, belong to the, the older son. It was all his. And he was loved too. I think it's easy for us to kind of forget because we look, at, we look through scriptures and we, we see the kind of the, this antagonistic relationship between the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes and Jesus, right? And he had some pretty not nice things to say about him at times. He called them whitewashed tombs and dens of vipers and things like that, right? Uh, because the things that they were doing were divisive and they were keeping people from coming to him. But in here we see the father loves the older brother too. He's compelling him. Come home. Come celebrate with me. And so I, as we look at this, it's really, it's really important for us to focus on the main character of this story because we all in different times and at different points can relate to this idea of sin separating us, right? Maybe we've, we're in this point where maybe, you know, we're, we're, looking at, we're looking at the world right now and we're thinking, you know what, that looks pretty fun. I, you know, there's some things about being it, this Christian life and the, the life that, we, that God has called us to that's sometimes hard. Right? It feels maybe a little bit restrictive. Uh, and so we look out and we think, you know what? Being married is hard. Maybe, maybe there's something better out there. Right? Or being, um, you know, obeying, you know, like being sober is hard. Being responsible and fulfilling my, my obligations as a father is hard. And we think, you know what? If I could just, I just want a taste of that. And we look at the grass on the other side and we think, maybe, maybe we should do it. And that sin has already, even though we haven't done anything, that sin is beginning to separate us. Maybe we've already done some of those things, right? And maybe you have that voice in your ear thinking, saying to you over and over again, you really, how could God love you? You haven't, you don't deserve to be a son anymore. And the shame, the voice of shame keeps calling to you and saying, you know what? Maybe you shouldn't go to church this morning. You don't really, you know what you did this week. You know the thoughts that are in your head. You know where your heart is. Does God really want you on his team? Or maybe on the other side of that shame or the, of that performance bubble, you're thinking, you know what? Pretty good, right? Uh, I, got, I, I got this together. And you're pretty, and now those people... Maybe you would never put it that way, but that's, that idea of pride kind of and self-righteousness has a tendency to creep its way into your heart. And you think, you know what? I'm, God's pretty lucky to have me on his team. Whatever it is, God's response, the Father's response is this. You're my son. Right? You're not because of anything that you've earned or deserved, not because of anything you've done or not done but because I love you, because you were born into my family. And in case you've doubted the love of God for you uh, recently, uh, think about some of the things that we, some of the passages, one of the things that kept coming to my mind is, for God demonstrated his love for, this, for us in this, that while we were still sinners, while we were still prodigals or proud or whatever, Christ died for us. The goal is for us to understand fully the price that, our, that Jesus, the one who told it, by the way, he made this story up. Right? This isn't a true story. It's a story that was made up in Jesus' mind to convey how much he loved both the Pharisees and the tax collectors and sinners. And he demonstrated that love for both groups and that while we were, they were still sinners, he died for them. <laughs>